Hey, hey, everyone. It is I, Sleepy Reader, a.k.a. Damien. I'm here with a haul. And uh, let me crack open a beer first. I need it. Um, I've been buying a lot of stuff online. And then since my comic book shop reopened, I um, traded him some comics and got a lot of credit. Actually, truth to be told, it was one comic. <laughs> and it got me a lot of credit, so I've been buying a lot of his back issues, too. So I think I'm going to do probably a series of uh, comic call videos. We'll see how it goes. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to show you... <clears throat> get some lubrication down that throat. First thing I want to show you, though, is I got a fantastic gift from... Mark at Four Color Commentary. Um, he has a great channel. I I am relatively new to his channel, but I, I really enjoy watching it. And he's a, a great guy if you're interested in back issue, the back issues, the old comics, the nostalgia, the history. Um, definitely a lot of fun to watch. And in one video, he does some amazing push-ups. But so he did a video talking about these spirit sections as they were called reprints in black and white of the old spirit sections the one of the ways that will eisner's the spirit was kept alive in reprints bef i believe in the years before um warren comics took it up so uh he had some i i was just commenting on a video of his and saying oh i i've heard of those but i don't see them in the wild and um and he said oh i have some duplicates can I send them to you? And, and I couldn't say no to that. So uh, fantastically, he sent me uh, this huge number of uh, duplicates. I haven't uh, actually counted how many of them there are yet. Um, I, he did get them to me about a week ago, but I just haven't had too much time. I did read a few of the notes on the back of each one. And in the video I'm looking at right now, it's back, backwards, but it probably won't be backwards later. On the back of each one is, a, is some notes about um, that particular story. So this is uh, from June 2nd, 1940. Uh, I don't know, this may be the first spirit. I don't, well, it could be. Because on the back he says the origin of the spirit. Um, so anyway, I just love the fact that there's all these story by story notes by Will Eisner for each one of these. So each one of these is just um, four pieces of paper because they're they're eight they're seven page stories plus the note at the back. I don't know if Eisner was publishing them these himself or a different publisher. There's no mention of the publisher at the time. It says Collector's Edition, copyright 1972 by Will Eisner. Um, when did the Spirit magazine come out? I want to say it started. I'm guessing in 74, 75. Um, yeah, October, the, the note is even signed with a date, October 72 there, for the June 16th. These appeared in the newspapers, they were in color, um, but I think they actually look better in black and white. So these are the, uh, the very early spirits, Eisner would have been a very young man there, then he went off to war, and other artists, uh, oh, it's not something that's hidden from anybody who's an insider of comics, who the other artists were, people like Lou Fine, uh, but other artists took over the spirit from Eisner while he was off at war. And then when he came back, he did his uh, most classic run for about five years on the spirit, five or six, or maybe even seven years on the spirit, um, with help of assistance, but still uh, just an incredible run. So this would be early Eisner, though, and I, I haven't dug as deeply into that, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm just so excited about reading those notes. And I have to see if there's a whole bunch more that I can get, um, but this is a really nice supply of them. There's July 14th. This is uh, Eisner just beginning his, uh, his tricks with the splash page to get people's attention in the newspaper. Um, this is uh, July 21st, practically today, but um, 60, no, uh, 80 years ago. July 28th, 
coming up. That's uh, interesting stuff. And as most of you probably know, you know, Will Eisner kind of, as he went along during the 40s um, in the spirit, invented so many of the tricks of the trade and the art form of comics. So um, uh, not only do I just love the spirit stories, but it has that um, that uh, his, uh, comic book history aspect to it that I love. So, and then the last one I got was August 11th. So this is an incredible starter pack for me on this kind of spirit. Someday I'll do a video where I show you all the different ways I've collected the spirit. Because I do have some, of a uh, handful of those original spirit sections from the newspaper. They're in terrible shape. Um, the newsprint from a newspaper really does not last. Um, but I don't have any of these really early ones. Um, I have ones from the late 40s, I believe. So, um, and an interesting thing, I don't think it's these ones it's talking about, but in this Inside Comics from spring of 1974, and as I said, these were October of 72. Yeah, all of the notes are from October of 72. So they were probably published as a package, I'm assuming. Um, and I used to see them advertised every now and then in some little advertisement at the back of Warren magazines. I think they just called them the spirit sections or something like that, but I've not seen them mentioned too often in too many places. Let me put these back in the bag. So anyway, uh, deep thanks to Mark. And uh, so he's a, a solid man down there in uh, Oklahoma. And uh, I will, of course, link to his channel down below. He certainly deserves more more people. So uh, just on the subject of the spirit, one little item in this Inside Comics from 1974 was about the upcoming Spirit magazine. And it's it, a little um, subtitle that says, Spiritually Speaking. And it just reads, uh, Spiritually Speaking, now that Warren Publishing Company has contracted Will Eisner to produce a bi-monthly Spirit magazine, the company has been buying up all the existing supplies of spirit material in the hopes of cornering the spirit readership. So I assume they they bought up those spirit sections, and that's why I would sell, see them for sale in the backs of Warren magazines. Because Warren, I think Warren basically created their own catalog of nerdy good things, which they sold at the back of their magazine. All kinds of things, even like... Uh, reel-to-reel -reel, uh, recordings of things and uh, like uh, old old uh, radio serials and uh, you could buy movies from, you know, old monster movies from them and all kinds of things. Anyway, um, so now they've uh, contracted to produce this uh, spirit magazine. The company has been buying up all the existing supplies of spirit material in the hopes of cornering the spirit readership. Quote, I don't want anything competing with my product on any level, said publisher James Warren. We're in business to survive and make money, and to survive, you have to eliminate all the competition you can. Chief among available spirit material was Krupp Comic Works, the spirit number one and the spirit number two. So are those the underground ones? I thought those were kitchen sink, but maybe that was called Krupp, or maybe Krupp is something else I don't know about. In order to stop further distribution of the underground book, Warren Publishing bought up the complete print run of both books. Tyler Lancey, business manager of Krupp, told Inside Comics reporter Ron Steinitz that Warren bought everything we had, lock, stock, and barrel, and he paid 23 and a half cents a book for them. James Warren, however, refused to comment on the price of the books. What we pay for our merchandise is private, he later commented that his real comment is that Lancey is wrong. Still later, however, he admitted that there are many ways to look at the price of an item. <laughs> so I don't know what that, all that's about. But uh, I think it's kind of funny because I have a feeling if I stumbled across uh, some underground publisher publishing the uh, spirit, that would have led me to buy more of those Warren comics. But anyway, that's the way, that's the way Jim Warren saw it. I just thought that was an interesting tidbit. I've I've gotten a bunch more of these Inside Comics, so I'll probably have little tidbits from Inside Comics to throw out every now and then. 
I'm not going to pile them all up there because they're all going to start sliding down. So there's already a big stack of comics sitting over there. The ones I decided to save for a, another haul. Some of the ones I decided to save for another haul. So another thing I did um, involving my fellow geeks was there's a fellow I follow on Twitter who's been selling off bits of his collection, I think because he's unemployed. And I don't recall his name off the top of my head. He's someone I've just been following for a little while on Twitter, but he's pretty cool. So I'll try to put his Twitter down below. But one thing he was selling was the entire run of The Wake by Scott Snyder and um, Murphy. I can't remember Murphy's full name. Sean Murphy. Um, the Wake. And this is one that I originally decided to trade weight on because already at the point this was coming out, I was starting to think I preferred Snyder in trades. But I never did buy the trade, and um, chances are it doesn't have very good binding anyway. So uh, I am glad now to have bought the entire run uh, in floppies. I can read it and, and see the art the way it should be seen, so to speak, uh, where you can lay it out flat. So I've got the wake one through, is it one through 10? Uh, I thought it was one through eight. Um, so I remember people talking about this being a weird thing where there was a first half of the story that they really loved and then this sudden disconcerting change. There's number 5 of 10 and number 6 of 10. And I, I'm really, even if it weren't written by, um, by Scott Snyder, I would be very interested in this because of the Sean Murphy art. And that is 7 of 10, 8 of 10, yeah, so they did publish 10, 9 of 10. And it was some kind of futuristic story involving uh, underwater stuff, but I can't, I can't remember what people used to talk about it. But So I kind of am excited to read it because I can't remember what all the reviewers on YouTube said about it oh so many years ago. So uh, this was quite a bargain, and I, I think... The person whose name I can't remember for offering them so cheaply on on Twitter. So, and another connection to YouTube this time is the fabulous Gore Vidal, and I'll put a link. I think most people who subscribe to me know who Gore Vidal is already, or people who watch my videos regularly. But I will put a link to Gore down below, and maybe to the specific video where he talked about Kelly Green, uh, this European comic book album series that was done by the American comic strip uh, creators, Stan Drake and Leonard Starr. And um, so I swooped in after seeing uh, Gore's video on Kelly Green and got the complete Kelly Green, um, the complete collection off of Amazon because it's out of print. Um, well, that doesn't explain. I, mean, I was able to find it in the Amazon marketplace. And uh, I think, and, and it, it's the only place you can get the English translation of the last graphic novel. It has all the graphic novels put in together. And this is a black and white edition. I think what Gore was showing was in color. So I'm just slightly bothered by that, just because I love color in comics. But um, on the other hand, and especially uh, the old European coloring is very interesting to me. But on the other hand, this is beautiful black and white artwork. Um, Leonard Starr was a really great artist. And I think there's some introductory material here that explains some of the genesis of this book. I don't know how common it was for American artists to get hired by the European market. Here's some examples of uh, comic strips they work both worked on. Annie and... Uh, Mary Perkins, and one of them worked on Blondie for a while. Um, I don't know if he was directly credited. It probably still said, oh, it says Young with Drake. So it was Stan Drake working on Blondie. I don't know if he did the writing or did the drawing or both. I'm trying to, I think, whoa. I thought there were some examples of the color covers, but I guess maybe there isn't. 
So anyway, I, I really look forward to uh, digging into this. And it's a very nice hardback. Originally published by something called Classic Comics Press. There it is. It out the. Um, it has nice binding. There it is without the uh, without the cover, just a white cover. And then uh, while we're talking on trades, um, a couple of the trades I got recently is I got this thing called Watchmen Companion. And I thought when I was reading the description on in stock trades that it combined um, Dave Gibbons watching the Watchmen with some other material, like an omnibus of extra Watchmen material. But I think um, this is an expanded universe of the Watchmen for a, um, a kind of Watchmen. Uh, role-playing game maybe I'm not sure I don't fully understand it yet so I, I just got it recently and I haven't really done more than flip through it and on the back it says this more sanctioned prequel came to life in the form of two game modules Watchmen watching the Watchmen and Watchmen taking out the trash so you, Watchmen watching the Watchmen that's what I thought it was um, and it says incorporating new mythology and adventures alongside new art from series artist Dave Gibbons. Even if I'd understood what it was, I would want to have it because I'm kind of collecting all the different Watchmen stuff I can. So, um, uh, unfortunately, I'm not someone who knows very much about role-playing games or any other kind of uh, games other than Mon Monopoly or uh, Angry Birds. But uh, I still look forward to, to reading this and taking in wherever the new, the new art from Dave Gibbons is in here. Um, so anyway, an interesting side note that I did not know that there was a sanctioned by Alan Moore uh, Watchmen game modules. Uh, nothing on the cover inside the dust jacket. So um, I may have more to tell you about, about this book. And then, so realizing then that I could not get it on in stock trades, I had again went to the Amazon marketplace and got a used copy of Watching the Watchmen, Dave Gibbons actual art book about um, about the sort of background of producing the Watchmen comic, which is just packed with sketches and thumbnails and early um, early versions of things. So it's definitely the ultimate process geeks look at the Watchmen with design by this guy Chip Kidd, who, you know, he's like this super famous book designer. I do sometimes get a little annoyed that he maybe is more interested in whatever his design aesthetic is than in readability sometimes. Um, not that I, I'm unhappy about having this book, but. Like, for instance, there's a lot of drawings that are uh, on fake crinkled paper. Let me see if I can find any of those right now. Yeah. But there's some interesting sketches for alternate covers while we're flipping through it. Yeah. I... But often Chip Kid will will put things in that he thinks looks cool, but maybe don't give you the full picture or as clear a look at things as you might want. Um, I don't know. Some of these are convincing that maybe that really was what the crumpled up paper looks like now, and others of these feel like there's a purposeful crumpling up. Dave Gibbons went to the trouble of making his own Rorschach ink blots. Um, <laughs> Very admirable. There's, there's some more stuff. Also, the binding, not as good as it should be. Let me guess, was this published by... No. Published by Titan Books and DC Books together. So, but uh, anyway, too bad it doesn't have better binding. One of my big bugaboos. So why, you ask, was I wearing 3D glasses? 
because one of the things I ordered online was 3D laser laser eraser and press button, which um, actually comes with its own 3D glasses that I think you have to kind of build. Like you, here's the, uh, I think these are the, wait. You have to kind of build your 3D glasses or put them together. And I'm lazy, so instead I uh, I already had these ones sitting around. Uh, so I can look at this 3D. So I didn't realize until just recently that, that they did some laser eraser uh, stories, original stories for the American market. There, it wasn't just... Um, the British stories brought over from Warrior Magazine to be reprinted by Eclipse. And I don't know why it always tickles me to get um, 3D things. This is not this is not the greatest 3D comic, actually. Um, but if you have 3D glasses there, maybe you can take a look at the screen and get a little idea. I mean, the 3D effect is not that useful. And along with this, I, I grabbed some other issues uh, online of laser eraser and press button. Um, and I think I'm missing, missing, I think I got, other than the 3D one, I got three of the regular issues. Here's number one. Um, and this, uh, if I'm not making clear, there was a, a, a British magazine called Warrior Magazine that also actually did have distribution to American comic book shops or circa 1981-82. Um, I used to read them. And they're famous for being uh, containing two major Alan Moore comics in them. But they also, in every issue, had these uh, adventures of Laser Eraser. Uh, or, or Axel Press Button, I guess. Maybe Axel Press Button is the main character. I'm trying to remember now. But these are newer ones, still written by the same writer, and some of them drawn by Steve Dillon, or at least the first issue drawn by Steve Dillon, who was the original artist on the British ones. Although I found out that this this character goes back from before a Warrior magazine. They explain somewhere in here that he was featured in a number of um, I can't find it now a number of British underground comics or music magazines or something before that. This looks cool, Johnny Nemo magazine. <laughs> so anyway, there's issue one, and I can't remember what other issue I got, maybe three, and then I also got issue five. And by issue five, it's being drawn by Mike Collins, inks by Mike, Mark Farmer. Um, so Axel Press Button, and la I think the woman is Laser Eraser. It's been a long time since I've read their stories from Warrior Magazine, and I never even knew about these Eclipse. I, I thought Eclipse was just doing uh, colorized reprints. But thanks to Terrence Comic Crack, I'm trying to learn more, more about Eclipse, you know, which were comics that I sometimes picked up at the time, but I wasn't like paying fully, fully paying attention. So, uh, I don't know. Before I wear out my welcome too long, let me show you some more stuff that I pulled out of the comic book boxes at my shop. I got this Jimmy Olsen issue, uh, probably from the mid-60s, I'm guessing, number 83, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, I like that cover a lot. And uh, the goofiness of Jimmy Olsen is always, from the Silver Age, it's always fun to read. And then kind of the opposite end of the Silver Age, or maybe we're looking at almost the Bronze Age here, I just heard someone define the Bronze Age as ending in 1972, uh, Arlen Schumer. And I, I liked that quite a bit because I always bothered by some people end the Bronze Age in 1960. Sorry, begin. I've been saying Bronze Age all along when I meant Silver Age. Arlen Schumer says the Silver Age ends in 1972. A lot of people say it ends in 1969 or, the, or 1970 when Jack Kirby went over to Marvel Com oh over to DC Comics. But anyway, it always f it, it feels 72 sounds good to me. 71, 72 maybe. Anyway, so this is probably from 1970. It's Captain America number 36 with I'm not quite sure. I think it's 
a Sal Buscema cover, but it might be John Buscema. Their styles were very close together at this stage. I um, mean, it might depend on who inked it. But on the inside, it's uh, Gene Colin, Gene Col, Gene Colin, inked by um, Bill Everett, I believe, who was a very good inker, along with all his other accomplishments. Is this the one that's inked by? Yeah, Bill Everett embellisher. And it's not easy, I suspect, to do a good job inking Gene Colin because of the the way Gene's pencils were. Anyway, really nice issue, nice copy, or at least for me a nice copy. I was very happy to get that. And then I got um, Captain America and the Falcon number 140. Uh, still probably 1970. And probably from 71, I'm just going by the price pricing on the covers, uh, 145, Captain America and the Falcon. Um, that's a John Romita cover, I'm positive. And actually this other one is definitely a John Romita cover. I don't, John Romita did not always sign, but sometimes did. And here in the corner, sideways, is a JR. Um, great covers. John Romita was pretty incredible. Oh, that's water. Here's the beer. And then out of the cheap box, I guess because of the egregiously torn cover there is this wonderful issue of dead men of challenges of the unknown with dead men uh, neil adams cover and strangely the cover just feels really nice even though it's obviously been abused in many ways um but it's, it's a story with art by oh well there's another reason for it having been in the cheap i didn't even notice that before uh, having been in the cheap bins. But uh, so the first half is drawn by George Tusca, a very nice George Tusca. I guess he's inking himself perhaps, and that might be, might have helped a lot. And then the second half of the story uh, is drawn by Neil Adams. So it's kind of odd to have this uh, hidden Neil Adams portion of the story at the end. Or is it a separate story? I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a second story. Because the challengers are still there and Dead Man's still there. Um, so I think I'll, I might want to keep an eye out for this story, <laughs> for this comic, in better condition. Although this is a perfectly fun reader's copy. I do get, I particularly don't like it when the cover is not attached to the rest of the comic. And amazingly, this was loose in the box with no bag, and yet, yet the cover did not fall off when I picked it up. I had no clue the cover was detached. In the same box, I got this House of Mystery. And what I love about these things is it's like op opening up that box of Cracker Jacks and not knowing what the prize will be inside. For the old-time uh, lover of comics art, there's often some nifty cool surprises in here and here for me I opened it up and there's some Frank Thorne artwork and I was really happy about that um, I, I've become more and more a fan of Frank Thorne's work not just on Red Sonia but on other things so that was that was really good to see who, who wrote the story does it say uh, Michael Fleischer did the script um, and then the second story is by Bernie Wrightson with Michael Kaluta doing the inks. So this was quite the, the prize for me. Um, and it's, again, not in a bag. It was in the cheap bin because of that rip on the back cover. And yet, other than that rip, it seems in very nice shape. Anyway, I'm happy to have it as a reader copy. Another reader copy was this uh, Phantom Stranger. I'm slowly picking up more and more Phantom Strangers, although I, I think maybe they're coming out with an omnibus. Sometimes I prefer to get things like this in an omnibus. This has um, Fred Carrillo art, Paul Levitt's writing. So I was thinking it was going to be Jim Aparo. I think that's a Jim Aparo cover. But um, looks really nice. Oh, and it's got a backup uh, 
story by the same artist, Fred Carrillo, and script by Michael Fleischer about the um, Black Orchid. So that's interesting. Oh, and here's another one that seemed like a prize to me in the bargain bin with totally trashed cover, everything kind of yellow. But uh, I love getting these strange tales, not only for the Jim Starenko artwork in here, which is, of course, awesome. Although I most, I prefer, oh man, look at that. There's the rest of the cover. Feels like it was burnt or something. Like what happened to this cover? It's toasty. Um, I like, uh, for some reason, Starenko I like getting in the really slick omnibuses. And now there's going to be one of those giant sized Starenkos. And I'm definitely going to buy that. But even somehow, oh, this is very cool though. Uh, cool Storenko stuff. Even more exciting to me somehow, because I just wasn't expecting it, is this really cool Dan Adkins um, Doctor Strange artwork in the back. With this guy with three heads. What was his name? I always forget. It says the three faces of doom. What is this guy's name? They're not saying his name. Hmm. The Living Tribunal. I knew he had a weird name. So I look forward to that. And it's written by a writer I never heard of, Jim Lawrence. And it's interesting because the credits are kind of confusing. If you uh, didn't know how to interpret, Stanley eminently MCs this Jim Lawrence, Dan Atkins, Planetary Pulse Stopper. Lettered by the quivering quill, quill of Al Kurzrock. I don't recall Al Kurzrock. So, um, who was Jim Lawrence? I don't know. Does anyone know? Was that a pseudonym for someone else, maybe, who was working at DC? But I love, I love this Dan Atkins artwork. I mean, it's like Wally Wood, I suppose. Uh, it's like having Wally Wood draw. Um, I guess, what do I do with this piece? I don't know. Okay, and then also from those bins was, uh, those bargain bins was uh, this random issue, number one, of Gems, Son of Satan. I have never read this, despite my obsessive love for Gene Colan. So, and it looks like good Gene Colan art, although um, Gene Colan art also would be well suited to better paper. <laughs> the, the, the paper maybe was a little better here at this point when comics were costing 75 cents. And speaking of probably from an earlier age, but a $1.50 comic on much better paper is this Destroyer Duck. I would never even guess that's a Jack Kirby cover, but I believe it is. It says Kirby Al Alcala there. Um, Alfredo Alcala definitely changed people's artwork. And it is Steve Gerber and Jack Kirby uh, working with uh, Alfredo Alcala and uh, someone named Odorfla as the colorist. Um, and as probably most of you know, this was a comic that was raising funds for, for uh, Steve Gerber to have a lawsuit against Marvel Comics. So Jack Kirby and Alfredo happily joined in. Um, I'm a bit of surprised Alfredo Alcala joined in. Maybe had he left Marvel completely by then? I assume working on this comic would not... Uh, not be a good move if you wanted to keep working for Marvel. But that's very cool. I think I'm only missing one or two. Uh, I'm one or two of the of the Destroyer Ducks that are drawn by Kirby. But and then I understand there's a few that aren't drawn by Kirby, and I would like to get those too. Um, and then in the back, there is this um, Jerry Siegel Val Myrick story which Steve Gerber was the ever editor of. So it's interesting to see Jerry Siegel in on this comic that was fundraising again to sue for creator rights. Um, and this is very nice Val Myrick artwork too. Let's see. I think I'm about hitting my limit here. So many comics. I'll just have to show you more tomorrow. Here's uh, an issue of Mag... Magnus Robot Fighter, and I, I believe I discovered this is a reprint. So at some point they stopped making new Magnuses, 
or less new Magnuses and, and did reprints. So, um, yeah, this is 30 cents, but I think you could go back and find the exact same cover with either 15 or 12 cents on it. But still, I was happy to find it and enjoy the, um, enjoy the Russ Heath artwork. No, sorry, ha Manning. What's his name? Um, not Russ Heath. Russ Manning, is that his name? Anyway, I love the, uh, the artwork. The stories are sometimes kind of dull in Magnus the Robot Fighter, how you can turn uh, this exciting futuristic world and battling robots into something dull, I'm not sure. But I haven't read a lot of Magnus, so I might, you know, I might, might have just read some of the duller ones, and there might be some exciting ones out there. Oh, messy man. Okay, and this was kind of fun. Jughead's Jokes, an entire comic of one-page Jughead and Archie gag strips. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, every single page is a new separate uh, joke. And that, that makes for a lot of fun reading for me. Uh, Jughead Oil Foil. Jughead in Work Quirk. I uh, can't imagine anyone doing comics like this now, but it's very, very charming. And you would think there'd be a lot of kids out there who would enjoy it if they could get their hands on something like that. And then I really liked, it's kind of beat up, but I really like this cover on Life with Archie. So I thought I'd grab this one. And um, ironically, whoa, the cover and the splash page are very similar. Very similar. Although the cover's got more going on. Um, this looks like some nice, nice artwork too. I'm not sure if the artists were credited at this point. I don't see credit. Or maybe it's a, it's it's uh, an ongoing story throughout the issue with chapters. But still, I don't see any any credit for an artist. I like the thick line. What should we make the last comic here? How about this Green Lantern? I oh, I was gonna say I think it's a Gil Kane cover, but there's a Gil Kane. Gil Kane signed signed the artwork, so um, it's definitely a Gil Kane cover. Very different from the covers later on by Gil Kane that we saw all over all over Marvel Comics that were just kind of nonstop twisty, battly kind of covers. Let's see if the in interior is... This one's in... Well, the back cover's in not so nice shape, but um, I only buy for readers' copies, but I still enjoy it when I do happen upon something. Story by Denny O'Neill, art by Gil Kane and Joe Gila. So that's that's quite cool. So this might be, I'm, I'm just guessing, shortly before... They rebooted Green Lantern as Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and uh, threw in the politics. This is from 1969. When did that famous run happen? Was that 71, 72? No, it was probably 70. So I think it's coming up right after this. Okay, thanks for joining me. Hopefully I will find the free time from my family to make some more haul videos because I got a lot more haul to show you and I enjoy doing it. And um, thanks again to Mark at Four Color Commentary. And um, thanks to Gore Vidal for making his, his video that led me to the Kelly Green. And uh, I also have a lot of other things that I wanted to kind of make little videos about. I, at one point I was fantasizing, oh, I, I have so much material I'd like to go through, I could make a video every day. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to get to that. My, uh, my daughter being at home full-time is just making me full-time friend, valet, butler, chauffeur, and what else, whatever else you've got <laughs> to this uh, young girl who can't see her friends or go to camp or what, go to school eventually. So uh, talk to you all later. Bye-bye.